So I'm here with Jamie Franklin. Uh, who are you? Who am I? <laughs> um, well, I'm a, I'm a priest uh, in the Church of England. I'm a priest in a, in a city called Winchester in England. And I'm the host of the Reverend Faith and Current Affairs podcasts with my two, uh, two friends, two colleagues, Tom and, and Daniel, who are also priests. And we talk about the news. We talk about what's going on in the world. Uh, but we do it from a robust Orthodox, small O Orthodox Christian perspective with it, which is somewhat at odds sometimes with the kind of stuff that you hear the Church of England coming out with in the media. Sometimes it sounds a bit sort of leftist, progressive, woke type thing. We're not really about that. We're about straightforward Orthodox engagement with the culture. So, so that's what we do. Um, and I do a bit of writing here and there and stuff like that as well. So that's who I am. I'm married. I've got four small children. I'm hoping one of them doesn't burst into my office during this recording. So that's what I am. <laughs> so uh my father is a priest uh, a christian orthodox uh uh religion as well but uh, uh we are uh, not catholic we are uh, orthodox yes yeah. so uh i'm curious to hear why you decided to become a priest and in what age yeah so i've only been a priest now for about I suppose I, I was ordained, how long ago was it? About two and a half years ago, coming up to three years. So I've not been a priest for very long, um, deaconed a year before that. So I've only just taken my first full-time, well, actually, I'm not full-time, my, my first uh, role in charge of a church, if you see what I mean. So I've been a curate up until now. So, yeah, I mean, it's quite it's quite a long story, really, but, but I suppose to sort of cut it short, um, my whole adult life, I mean, I found, I found Christ when I was um, about 19, or, you know, I suppose I'd say Christ found me when I was about 19. And, uh, from the moment I became a Christian, I was very, very passionate about the church. I loved, I loved the church. I've, I've always loved the church and I've been in different types of churches, very, very different types of churches. I've had a broad experience of the church, but the thing that I've always had in, um, the thing that those experiences have had in common for me is just my love for the church, for the people of God, uh, for scripture, for theology, all that stuff. I've always been so interested in it. Uh, throughout my whole adult life and it's just led naturally to me wanting to to pursue that as a way of life and as my main interest and now I sort of interpret that as a calling from God to be a, a priest and to to minister to the people of God and to share to share the the gospel and, and the message of Christ with the world out there so that's what I love really I mean I suppose that's the short answer to the question I love that um, I love doing that I love being involved in that kind of stuff and that's that's what's led me to to do this and, and to be ordained. And I, I can't really imagine doing anything else in my life. So I don't know if that answers the question, but that's that's it in a nutshell. Uh was it difficult the last three years? To be a what, to be a priest. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um well there are there are aspects of things which are difficult. Um the thing I love is um being with people sharing Christ with people, offering comfort to people and, and helping people really. That's what I love doing. I mean, I do that in person, obviously in my parish uh, and I do it uh, online as well um, with, with people. And I try and help people as, as much as I possibly can. Um, I think the on, thing on, online, how you do it, you mean with the podcast? Uh, yeah, stuff, with, right? with, the, with the podcast and we have, we have a huge amount of engagement with the podcast. You know, it's, it's almost like a kind of pastoral role in itself because People send me emails all the time. I have engagement with people getting in touch. And so, so do Tom and Daniel as well. Um, and a lot of the time people are interested in Christianity or they have problems in their lives and they really don't have anyone to talk to. They don't have anyone to encourage them or help them. And so they often read, they listen to our podcast and reach out to us. And it's, it's a tricky thing because it takes a lot of time. Um, but then, you know, I sort of feel like I can't just leave these people. Uh, without some kind of answer or some kind of help. So I do, I do the best that I possibly can. I mean, one thing we've done recently is on our website, reverendpod.com. So you, you, you answer all the emails that uh, you yeah, get? Yeah, I do pretty much answer every email unless it's, <laughs> unless it's like a time wasting email. Uh, it takes, it takes quite a long time to do it. But yeah, one of the things we've done is on our website, we've, we've, we started a church finder. 
So it's kind of like we think about it like a trip advisor, but for churches. And it's like it's a positive thing. So we don't have like negative reviews on there, but it's to help people find churches. Um, because lots and lots of people, um, especially over the last few years, and I'll talk about why in a minute, but lots and lots of people have become more interested in, in Christianity and, and going to church. Uh, but a lot of the time, the churches that they're around them, they're not really sure how to get into it. And they're not really sure. They don't want to go and be, um, you know, they don't want to be preached a political sermon. They want to be, they want something orthodox, you know, small o to orthodox, you know, something, something authentically Christian. And so the idea of the website is to help people on our map just find a church nearby and there's a little review on there, links them to a website. So that's a way of I'm trying to sort of delegate this this um the, you know this this work that that comes to me through the podcast. Um and that's that's I think been helpful for people. I think the thing that's been difficult is um you know, I think I think what happened with with COVID nineteen, you know, when all the churches shut down in our country more or less um and the church of england imbu- enthusiastically embraced the shutdown i think that was uh, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily the start of something i think it sort of revealed something about the na- where the church of england is at in our country which is i would say you know broadly speaking um broadly speaking too much in line with the culture uh, and the sort of progressive political um, fads that have taken over our culture and, and too little interested in the actual proclamation of Christ and of the gospel and of authentic Christianity. And so, um, I think we, we have a real struggle in the Church of England, especially as the established church to, to uphold the faith and to transmit the faith when I think largely speaking, the institution is, is captured by the spirit of the age. So it's a real problem. Uh, I'm not saying that everybody in the institution is captured by the spirit of the age, but but I think many people are sadly, and um, I think we have to contend for the truth in this in this context, and that's quite that's quite tricky. I'm I'm very pleased to be, have been given a a job, and I'm going to do this job as faithfully as, faithfully as I possibly can. But I know many people, many faithful Orthodox priests in the Church of England. Again, small O Orthodox, not Eastern Orthodox, just, you know, faithful Orthodox priests who are having a very hard time because they're being, um, they're being ostracized and marginalized and pressurized by people who are, um, you know, not representing the authentic Christian faith and, and causing all sorts of problems. So it's a struggle. It's an internal struggle in the Church of England. And um, my hope and prayer is that many, many Orthodox and faithful Christians will, will stay in the church and will contend for the, for the truth and that we'll see this thing turning around, but only God knows the future. I saw one podcast uh, of you and you said some numbers. You said that uh, the people that come to the church, uh, they in three years, they after, after COVID, they became half uh, of the, is that... Is that yeah. a, a true statement? And why you think uh, that happened? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I can't remember the exact details, but but um, so basically, prior to the COVID situation, um, it was about we had attendance on Sundays of about six hundred thousand, and then I think I mean it obviously dropped massively in the year when there was all the the shutdowns and everything, um, and then it rebounded slightly. I think it rebounded to about four hundred and fifty thousand. So it, um, it might might have been less than that. It might have been less than that. I have a feeling it was, but anyway, we see, you know, it's a reduction of twenty five percent or something like that, which is at- absolutely catastrophic in a, in a church which is which is uh, in massive decline. Anyway, the church has declined uh, since the early nineties. It's declined um, by one point two million to six hundred thousand prior to the. I'm sorry, uh, the COVID nineteen situation. And, and this is English uh, uh, England numbers, right? Yeah. That you're yeah. giving. It's the Church of England, yeah. So it's the institutional church. Um, it's the established church. So um, we're in decline anyway, and that's been, you know, the, the COVID situation has been catastrophic. And the reason it's happened is because the church has acquiesced to what was going on and just without any kind of discussion, any kind of debate, any kind of theological, um, any kind of theological reasoning, 
just shut the churches down and did it in such an enthusiastic way. And of course, what happens when you do that is it alienates people from the church and it stops people coming back. You know, church going is a habit. You always have a fringe of people on a, in a church community anyway. And, and those people get lost when you shut the churches down. And also it's, it's more, it's a, it's a, uh, it's an ideological thing as well. Because if you, if you say to people that you need to come to church because this is important for the salvation of your soul and the sanctification of your life, and you're telling people that you you believe in the church and you're trying to encourage people to go. And then suddenly you just shut the churches down and you say, well, the church doesn't matter. What matters is protecting yourself from this invisible virus. And then you're giving people the, the message that the church is not of, of central importance. And so, of course, fewer people are going to be interested if you don't believe in your own product you know not that i like to use that phrase but you know what i mean it's like i i believe in the church you know and the churches are serve a crucial and important function a central it's more than important it's absolutely essential thing for people you know to be fully uh, human uh, to know uh, christ uh, so if you shut them uh, down then it gives the impression that you don't care and you don't think it's important so yeah sorry at at the point that they shut them down they they showed that uh, science is higher than religion. Yes. They showed that, uh, yes, we agree with all the stuff that you are saying and we agree that science is higher than religion. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a, it's a competing religious worldview. I mean, I, I completely, I completely agree with you. And so rather than, rather than, look, I'm not saying I don't believe in, um, the, the value of science or the utility of science or anything like that. But my problem with it is that there was no theological engagement whatsoever. You know, in, in, in the medieval period, um, theology was called Regina Scientia, which means the queen of the sciences, which basically means that everything else was understood in the light of theological truth, which is just the truth that there is a God, that the scriptures are true, uh, that what God has revealed in Christ is reality. And then everything else is understood in that light. And so you get other subjects, you know, leading up to the great subject, as it were, um, you know, mathematics or astronomy or, or music or whatever it was. These would be lesser subjects. And then theology would be the great subject, which orientated all the other subjects. And that's the way it should be, because that is the way it is. All things were created by God and all things find their proper order in relationship to God. And what was revealed with the situation with, with COVID is that the church had completely lost that understanding of theology as reality and instead had posited another type of reality in its place, which is, of course, as you say, the kind of scientific materialist reality where the only thing that's actually real is the physical world. The only thing that matters is the physical body and protection from, you know, contagion or whatever it was. I mean, even, even, even on that basis, I was still challenged what, what happened um, on a number of levels, but on a theological basis, I think that that's what happened. I think it was basically a kind of revelation of um, a, a lack of, a lack of belief and a forgetfulness of what the theological worldview actually is. So uh, we talked before about the uh, the reduction of people going to the church on Sundays, and you, you your assumption is that because this is happening because the the church is losing their ground, they don't stick to their values. You think you think is because uh, of young people are changing. They are I don't know maybe more educated than what they were like. A hundred years ago, fifty years ago, and they question things. Why do you think uh, this is? What do you think is the major reasons on this? Uh, well, I mean, I certainly, it's certainly not because people are better educated than they were a hundred years ago. I mean, that's that's definitely not what it is. I I, I think people are people are more brainwashed than they were a hundred years ago. You know. Um, People are brainwashed into the progressive ideology, and this is um, absolutely pervasive. It just—it doesn't just happen in the classroom; it happens all day long. You know, on on people's on people's smartphones, on their computers. You know, there you see young people today walking around. They're just connected to these things, like they're like they're part of their body. So, I think that you know, Phidias, um what we pay attention to becomes reality for us. You know, that's that's a basic law of of um, of psychology or spirituality or whatever you want to say. Uh, if you pay attention to something, it becomes real to you, you know, and um, if you pay attention to iPhones and, and, you know, TikTok or whatever it is or 
the material world in some aspect, if you're just focused on that all the time or TV, um, then that's real. That's what, that's what seems real. That's what feels real. Um, the spiritual world is real. God is real, but we have to attend to God in order to, to know him and to, to feel that he is a reality to us. And I think that the overwhelming reason why we as a culture and especially the, the youth culture have lost contact with spiritual reality is because everything that they experience mitigates against paying attention to the spiritual world. They're completely and totally distracted by, by the culture, by the progressive ideology. A big part of that is technology. A big part of that is school, of course. And, you know, that's, that's the way, that's the way it is. So I, th- I think that that's a massive challenge. And I, I'm not sure um, I've got anything to say about anything helpful anyway to say about how we, how we meet that challenge. But I, I, I think that that's, I think that's a reason. But yeah, I mean, people are definitely not better educated nowadays, in, in my opinion. I think the vast majority of young people are extremely poorly educated, I'm sorry to say. Interesting. So basically, as to rephrase what you said, for me to understand, you said that uh, all these uh, media, all these, uh, the, the, they don't make the people smarter or cleverer. They just uh, brainwash them and uh, attract them to different paths and, and separate them from God. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, I think also, you know, just as a more general point, I think social media, um, the internet and, and just the, the kind of technology that's available to us, it just, it just fragments our attention so that we're constantly going from one thing to another. And again, this is, you know, if you, if you compare the way that, the way that our attention is so fragmented to the way, you know, people were educated, um, in any other period in history, uh, you, you can see the, you can see the difference because education, again, education is about attention. It's about, is about being able to focus on something for, a, for a period of time long enough to, to learn something and embed some knowledge within you, within your mind or whatever. And, um, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's something that you train yourself into. You train yourself into concentrating on something for a long period of time. And then you can retain it or you can do it better. You grow in your skill or whatever. But with the, with the fragmentation of attention, uh, you can never concentrate on anything for, for, for any period of time. And that's, that's what I think, you know, the phone and the iPad and everything. I think that's what it does to you. It, me- it means that your attention is going from one thing to another. And it's a kind of habit that you train yourself into such that you can never actually attend to anything for any period of time. So I, I do think there's quite a serious problem there. And that's not good. Again, that's not good for the spiritual life, you know, and that's something I'm, Um, and lots of people struggle with because we're constantly on our phones. You know, I am as well. Um, the spiritual life means that you pay attention to God, pay attention to scripture, pay attention to prayer. You can't do that if your attention is fragmented all the time. So there's that aspect as well. So, uh, you personally spend some time with the young people and try to understand and what you learn, like uh, about all this stuff. Do you think there is hope? Uh, How do you, go and speak with them do you abandon uh, we abandon them like how do uh, how do you want think we should tackle this problem and what is your experience with the young people personally yeah well i mean i don't um you know have loads and loads of uh, recent experience with with you know youth culture and teenagers and stuff like that i mean my kids are all my kids are all six and under um and i've been i've been working in a you know until recently in a council estate where the demographics a bit older sort of families and older people. Um, so I don't claim to be an expert or anything like that. Um, I do think that the internet and social media, I do think it can be redeemed. And I see some people doing that really, really well. I wouldn't claim that we're doing that amazingly well. And again, with, with our, with our, um, irreverent podcast, you know, when I look at the demographics, the demographics are really, um, we're not, we're not, we don't get loads of teenagers listening and watching. It's more like 20, 30, 40, 50 plus. So we're not, we're not massively touching that, that audience on a reverend, but perhaps, you know, social media and other forms of um, internet communication can be, can be used, you know, stuff like, you know, to be honest with you, I mean, Phidias, you're an expert, aren't you? But, but for me, like, you know, things which have almost passed me by because, you know, they, I just haven't learned about them, things like TikTok and things like that. 
you know, there is there is potential here for the internet to be used for good, uh, as as well as for it to to cause destruction and mayhem. So I, I think you know maybe maybe through that as well. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> uh, how we approach the youth? Uh, uh, in my opinion, I think uh, the youth, honestly, it's. Uh, because I'm in direct contact with them a lot, uh, yeah. I think they are cleverer, very cleverer than uh, for people than 60, 70, 80, because they they have access to all the information right. and uh, they can understand some stuff about the world in comparison to the generation that is 60, 70, because, uh, and when you ask them and when you speak with them, they have very reasonable arguments for their beliefs and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the, the way to, to speak with them, first of all, is to, uh, understand and not judge them, I think. Yeah. And, uh, and just uh, trial and error and see what works. If you need to be on TikTok to be speaking to them, like, and you see some response on there, if you need to go to find a way to go, people go to schools to speak with them because they are, you can find them or yes, uh, or trial and error until you see what works uh, yeah. w with the young generation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good to hear. I'm glad that you've got a positive take on, on the generation generation below <laughs> yes so uh i'm um, because um in my country as well uh which is cyprus uh uh there is a lot of of decline as well in the uh, people that they go to ch um me personally I go to church on Sundays, maybe once a month, twice a month. And mm -hmm. uh, I saw through the, my lifetime, the last 15 years that, uh, uh there is no, like out of the hundred people that they are in the church, there's only three, four children. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, uh, and it's declining. And, and, but my, my question is more like what, uh, so what is the position that the church needs to take to welcome and grow their following, uh, yeah. uh, again? Yeah. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Well, I, well, um, what, what the church needs to do is it needs to be, um, confident in what it is and what its message is. So that's the main thing that I would say about it is that we need to be unashamedly Christian and to proclaim Christianity and the Christian gospel and the scriptures and the historic orthodoxy clearly and boldly. And we need to be less concerned with the things of the world, the things that people think are important and be, be who we are. That's, that's the main thing. Um, that's, and that's the problem. I mean, look, I'm not saying this is going to solve everything, and I'm aware of the fact that we're 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 on the other side of a tide of secularism which has been building for centuries, right? So we're we're talking about we're talking about a phenomenon which is far greater and and more significant than the moment we're living in right now. So so I'm aware of that. But nevertheless, the best response is still faithfulness and to seek God's blessing through faithfulness rather than capitulation to the spirit of the age. So that's that's the first thing I'd say about it. I think secondly, and this is something I'm engaged in at the moment, I'm actually trying to write a, well, I am writing a book a book about this, um, which you know, is just on the, I'm just at the beginning stages of it, but it'll be pub published next year. Um, I think it's to point out that um, the, to point out to people the catastrophic consequences of, abandoning christianity not only personally but for civilization as well you know we we are living on borrowed time as a as a civilization because the uh, well to put it simply the understanding of humanity that we've been operating with for 2000 years now has been pretty much christian obviously we've been influenced by other sources as well but but essentially christian you know a judeo christian man made in the image of god uh, the compassion demonstrated to human beings across the social spectrum by Christ and so on and so forth. These things have 
become characteristic of our way of thinking about humanity. Um, and that's something which is, which is good and is something that we have automatically as, as, as human beings in our, in Western civilization or any civilization that has been influenced by the Judeo Christian culture. Um, the question is, as we abandon the Christian faith, what then happens to our understanding of humanity, of ethics, of the world, of how we should operate politically as well? And my, my view is that we will lose that Christian or Judeo Christian sense of what it is to be human and we'll end up reverting to a kind of barbarous uh, paganism. But this time, one which is aided by uh, massively different and superior technology. And uh, we already see signs of this. We cover this a lot in the podcast. We, we see signs of this with the um, increasing lack of, um, lack of respect for life, both at the beginning of life with children in the womb and also with, um, with people who are either aged or infirmed or, or terminally ill with euthanasia. I mean, witness, for example, Canada's uh, flourishing uh, euthanasia program. Um, and those, th- those are just, those things are just the beginning of, of what we're going to see in, in my opinion. You also have, um, organizations, um, like the WEF, you know, Yuval Noah Harari, um, who's a, who's a horrendous, um, philosopher of, of death, um, articulating for the first time a, a post-Christian attitude, a sort of technocratic post-Christian attitude. And it is truly horrifying to listen to, to what, to the kinds of things that he's talking about. So we're, we are, you know, we are on the cusp, I believe, of something, uh, horrendous. And the, the, the good news is, is that there is a solution, which is to recover the authentically Christian and to, and to fight back against this. But it's the only, it's the only thing that there is. There isn't any other protection against this. So I, I think that that's, that's less of a kind of personal and spiritual message. That's more of a kind of societal message. But I, I, I think we absolutely have to insist on this reality. Very interesting. I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the topic that what about other religions? Are there, are, do you agree with like, for example, what religions you accept? Like, for example, you accept Christian Orthodox people, you accept uh, Jewish people, you accept Muslim people in what way, or you think that the, the only true uh, gospel is the one that you have in your church? Like, how do you see other religions? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, yeah. I mean, so, to just to say at the beginning um uh, god loves all people and we're called to love all people and and show respect to people and um even if we don't have exactly the same view as, as them about things so i mean i think broadly speaking what i'd say is that i believe that um the fullness of of god's message to humanity has been revealed to us in jesus christ you know jesus christ is is the is the word of God, you know, he's God's communication to the word. He is the second person of the Trinity and he's the one we need to look to for, for wisdom and, and salvation. So that's, and that's what makes me a Christian, you know, that, that central fact. Um, now I believe that other world religions, um, vary. And I believe that the, the truth of any world religion or any philosophy actually, um, is um dependent upon how much it coheres with the truth of christianity because i believe that christianity is the truth now um something a religion like judaism is obviously the harbinger of christianity so it it has much much truth in it but there is the there is the the issue of, of christ which has to be which has to be reckoned with so we can't say that that's inconsequential or that doesn't matter um, but, um, it is nevertheless, it is, it is part of the Christian religion, um, Judaism and, and, and Christ is the fulfillment of the Jewish religion. So, um, so I have a lot of, um, a lot of time for, for Orthodox, oh, sorry, for, um, religious Jews and, um, for the Old Testament scriptures, obviously, because they're part of our scriptures as well. Um, and with, you know, with other religions like Islam or with, with Hinduism, uh, with, with Buddhism, there would be aspects of them where I would, where I'd recognize the wisdom in them. But then there would also be aspects of them, which I would think are, are very wrong and, and very bad. I think it, it just varies. And, and again, it would be similar with something like, um, you know, uh, Platonic or Aristotelian philosophy. You know, these people were, were um, 
were pagans in a technical sense, but they were nevertheless reasoning their way to towards the truth. They had a sincere desire. You know, I think I believe that people like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle they had a sincere desire to know the truth, and they did actually discern quite a lot of truth using using human um, reason. And so, there's no need to to reject wholesale uh, world religions or, or uh, other philosophies, uh, but we can actually engage with them and glean the truth that that um, that inheres within them, um, because ultimately, all truth belongs to to God. So that would be my that would be my view on that. So you are referring so much times back to the the truth is the scriptures and the gospel. So uh, so I'm curious to understand what you mean by that and uh, what uh, what is the truth? What is the truth? Yes. Um, <laughs> it's a broad question. Um, well, ultimately, I believe that the truth is, is a person who's Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus Christ says, I am the truth. I'm the way, the truth and the life. So, um, I don't, I don't believe that the, the truth is, is fundamentally and ultimately embodied in the scripture. I believe that the scripture is a sort of signpost to, to Christ and, and that we find the truth in the person of Jesus Christ. So, I mean, you can ask me any supplementary questions you'd like, but that would be my sort of um, starting point there. I believe that Jesus Christ is the kind of full truth, which is revealed to us, at least at this stage, about about God. So, yeah. So I don't know if that makes sense. So you, you're saying that uh, you don't you don't see the truth uh, in the gospel or the all this. You see the truth in the uh, Jesus Christ and all the other stuff, uh, they are just helping this truth. Yeah. I mean, I believe that the scriptures are the truth. I believe that they are inspired and that they're, they're given to us by God. Uh, but, but the important thing I think is to say is that, um, the scriptures, you know, the Bible is something that is not in itself divine, but it points towards the divine in Christ. And it's, it's a totally reliable. It's God's message to us. You know, it, it is a, it's something which is absolutely essential for the spiritual life and so on and so forth. But in itself, it is, it is a way of seeing and knowing Christ ultimately. So I'm not, I'm not saying it's not important or it can't be relied upon or anything like that. Um, it very much can. Um, but ultimately it's a, it's a way of knowing God. Uh, I'm going to say here, uh, I asked some people and some friends uh, coming in this interview, like, what is the most common um, objections that uh, young people have about the religion? Yeah. So I wanted to po point them out and I wanted to hear your your thoughts on yeah. that. Uh, a lot of times they, they are... Uh, conflicted with the evolutionary theory of Darwin. In, uh, uh, so I'm curious to hear uh, what are your thoughts about the origin of life? So essentially the, 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 the objection would be that evolution contradicts scripture, contradicts, you know, what's in Genesis and so on. Um, is that, is that, is that right? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Okay. So, I mean, I think there are, there are loads of things to say about this. Um, you know, if I, if I put my cards on the table, I'm very, very skeptical about, the evolutionary worldview. I, I, I think that there's, um, well, I think that it's somewhat, well, I'm just not sure I believe in it. Let's just put it like that. I think it, I think it may be just completely wrong, but, um, let's say, let's say it's not, let's say, let's say it's correct. And, um, that, you know, human beings evolved over a period of millions of years and that the, um, that the earth is very, very old and that all the organisms on the planet evolve from a single cell organism and and so on and so forth um there are there are loads and loads of theologians and biblical interpreters who have who have um found ways of understanding evolutionary theory as it was developed in the 19th century um finding ways of, of reconciling that with the accounts in scripture and this isn't just something that that came up in the 19th century as a response to evolutionary theory. There have, there have always been views of Genesis that, you know, the, the seven, the seven days are not actual 24 hour periods. I mean, St. Augustine, who's probably the most important theologian in history, um, said, said that he didn't think that they were necessarily 
days in the way that we understand days, and that this is more a kind of figurative or poetic render, poetic rendering of, of, of the, the creation of the world. Um, so I think I think you can read it. I think you can read it in that way, and I think there's a lot of scope for reading it in that way. Another uh, Protestant theologian who's just been doing work on this recently is uh, an apologist and, and theologian called William Lane Craig, who who says that this is a mythopoetic account of the the creation of the world, and that this is actually a genre of literature that you can see in scripture and elsewhere um, in the in the writings, you know, around the same time. So um, people have. So I think you know the options. The options I I would say are skepticism about evolution. Um, uh, reconciling the theory of evolution with scripture. Um, so that those would be the ways that I think you could, you could, you could approach it. Then the final thing to say about it, just sorry, one more thing. Even if the, so you take some, you know, kind of like, um, Richard Dawkins type view where he'd say, well, you know, evolution basically kind of disproves the Bible and therefore we should all be atheists. I mean, this is just, this is just complete nonsense. Um, even if evolution did disprove scripture um and it, it turned out that there were you know it was an inaccurate account of the creation of the world it wouldn't necessarily uh, contradict um it, well it wouldn't necessarily contradict the uh, existence of god i mean it, just to go back to those virtuous pagans i was talking about earlier they didn't you know people like aristotle and plato and so on, they didn't have scripture um they just used reason they used human reason to reason their way to the existence of of, uh, of a creator of the universe and um, the, exactly the same kind of arguments that they use would, would hold today. They've got nothing to do with they've got nothing to do with evolution. And that there, somebody like um, Thomas Aquinas, you know, his his five ways, things like the ar- argument from the contingency and so on. These things have nothing to do with evolution. They're about using uh, observation of the world and reason to to reason our way to the conclusion that, that God actually exists. So all you'd have done, even if even if evolution really does contradict, even if evolution is true and it contradicts scripture entirely, all you'd have really done is shown that the beginning of Genesis is is inaccurate, which is not an insignificant thing. Uh, but you wouldn't have proved that there's no God or anything like that. Um, there is a God and you can reason your way towards God. You don't need to you don't need scripture in order to know that god exists i mean i think the bible actually teaches that in romans chapter one so so there is that as well so even if you do get to that point where you say well you know i think evolution is true and scripture is wrong you still have to reckon with the existence of the universe and, and why anything exists at all and there there is no explanation for that apart from apart from a necessary cause which is which is god but that's a whole other subject so basically your answer to that is that uh you are not a hundred percent sure if evolution is true, but if, if you are saying if it's true, it doesn't mean that the God doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and and also you can reconcile. There are loads of people who think that you can reconcile evolution with with Genesis, and that it's perfectly doable. And um, you know, I, I I can't comment on those those things in detail because I don't have that. Right, right at my fingertips at the moment. But there's a, there's a vast body of literature out there. I've mentioned one, William then Craig, another Anglican theologian here, Andrew Davison has been doing work on that kind of thing recently. But they're, but they're all over, all over the place. Um, Christians who, uh, Tom Wright, N.T. Wright would be another name that springs to mind who have written about this subject and, and they believe that, um, evolution and, and Chris and, um, Genesis are entirely compatible. So yeah. I, I think, uh, a lot of times because of the lack of understanding the science, probably, uh, I can say, uh, the priest and like people of the church, they, I think you can easily make a connection between the, let's say evolution and God. Like you can easily say, okay, God is not, uh, is not stupid to not, uh, to do everything himself. Like yeah. uh, he, he just created a mechanism that everything will yeah. be created. So it's, uh, yeah. So it's, uh, uh, it's an interesting thing that I'm not saying that I believe a hundred percent or not the other, but uh, yeah. uh, I think if people of the church were a bit, uh, a bit more open-minded to understand at least what the theory of evolution is saying uh, and not dismiss it I- immediately. I'm not saying that it's true. The theory of evolution yeah, is yeah. true. Like nothing is true because science is just uh, improving and improving. And we don't know what will be the truth in a couple of years. Everything yeah. gets dismissed over time. Yeah. 
But what, what I would say, Phidias, is that the vast majority of priests in the Church of England and you know Anglican theologians living would would accept evolution wholesale, you know, and and just absolutely just take it as read that it's uh, every single bishop in the Church of England, I imagine, would. So it's not it's not it's not that there's a lack of acceptance. I would be an outlier to 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 express any skepticism at all. You know, many people would think I was some kind of lunatic just for saying that I, I wasn't sure that it was true. So it's definitely widely accepted in, in the Church of England. And of course, in the Roman Catholic Church as well, you know, is, um, the Roman Catholic Church's official position is is basically an acceptance of, of evolution. So it's there. Just to your other point, um, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, if you think about, um, if you think about entropy, you know, in, Everything in the world is subject to entropy, the, the breaking down of, of things over a period of time. But with evolution, I mean, it, assuming it's true, then this is not subject to the law of entropy for some reason. There's some kind of, there's some kind of force in the world that causes life to, to flourish and, and to grow and to develop. And I think you can easily see the divine hand in that i'm not saying it's like a sort of hand you know reaching down into the world and sort of manipulating things i'm saying it's a force you know uh, the psychologist uh, m scott peck talks about this in his book the road, road less less traveled it's a force that's inherent within the world that is is moving things towards life and development and growth and there's no reason for that force to exist especially when you consider the way that everything around everything around us is subject to entropy and decay there's a force of grace in this world, which is causing things to develop, causing things to grow, causing things to live. And I think you can absolutely say that that's, that's a, that's a sign of, that's a sign of God. That's, that's a sign of God's presence in, in the world. I wanted to bring up the next argument that the kids that I ask uh, about the religion, what the, they, they don't like necessarily. Uh, also they, they said, uh, also, the, I don't know if this is true in your, uh, your, uh, in, 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 in the way that you guys do things, but they said that the church is so early in the morning <laughs> that, uh, the, that the, it would be a struggle for, there is friction inside the, yeah. the task to go to church. So what do you think about that? Yeah, well, fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough, man. And uh, you've got to, you've got to do things, you've got to do things in a way which makes them accessible for people. So our church service here is about half past 10 in the morning, which I don't know, maybe that's, maybe that's too early. Um, you know, I think it's good to give people options. I mean, I went, when I, when I was at university, I went to church at half past 10 and managed to get up. Um, but you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's better just to stay up, you know, cause you'd stay up four or five o'clock in the morning as a student. So maybe just stay up all night, come to church and then go to bed. But, you know, no, I, I hear you. Uh, I'm listening. <laughs> so, uh, I think in my, in my religion, especially my father goes to church at 6 a.m. in the morning. So, nice. <laughs> so, uh, sometimes earlier and the church finishes at 9 30. So it's, it's, uh, I have no, I understand fully that there is no young people. There. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, the Eastern Orthodox, you know, they're, they're far more hardcore than, than we are. You know, our services last about an hour, but I know, you know, the Orthodox are there three, four hours. They're not even sitting down, you know, so that that's much more hardcore. I think we're quite soft in the West. <laughs> Okay, so uh, another argument that the, the people that they ask uh, told me, they said that uh, they feel that they are not inclusive to minorities like gay people and all this stuff. So uh, what uh, I don't, I, I saw you discussing this a bit, a fair bit on your podcast and stuff, and some appearances yeah. online. But it would be cool to hear your thoughts again here. Yeah. So, I mean, this is such a big issue that it's almost like hard to give an answer just in a moment because people have been so brainwashed and um, misled and lied to over, over these issues. Um, so it's almost like hard to, it's hard to know where to start. Um, so m minority, so the idea, let's just try and articulate what the problem is. The idea is that people think that the church is sort of, 
um, persecutes gay people or, you know, oppresses, oppresses women or, you know, is exclusive of other groups. I mean, there's the part of the problem is there's such a constellation of issues and they're all different. You know, somebody emailed me. I, I replied to an email earlier about this thing to do with women. Um, you know, somebody was saying about how the church has, has, has been patriarchal and it's oppressed women and, you know, it's made women's lives really bad and stopped them from doing this and that. You know, and I, I pointed out and you know, this, the, the history, the sort of history this person gave me was this kind of, you know, this, this, anti-Christian propaganda, which is just completely the opposite of the truth. And I pointed out to this person that, you know, if you went back to the, the time of antiquity to, to Rome and you saw the way people treated women in that culture, you'd, you'd, you'd absolutely recognize the superiority of a Christian culture when it comes to the relationship between men and women. Because the only reason that we have a conception of the equality of men and women is because of Christianity. There's no other reason for it. You, you don't get that in other cultures. You know, go to a go to a, a Muslim culture and and see if you like that better. You know, and and where we're where we're heading as a result, like I was saying earlier, uh, of the decline of Christianity is we're moving towards a pa- post Christian patriarchy, which is going to be a lot worse. I can assure you, we're already. I think we're already seeing signs of that. You know, with the, with the what the, does post Christian patriarchy mean? Well, it means it means a patriarchy that is characterized by whatever whatever is on the other side of the the decline of Christianity. So a secular patriarchy. And we're already seeing that with, you know, women's sports are basically under assault because men want to say that they're women and participate in them. Right. So so women are being beaten up in in MMA octagons and all this kind of stuff. And they're having their their careers ruined. And and then you've got men insisting they're women and being put in, in women's prison and raping women or men who insist that they are women and they're allowed in girls toilets. And there was a there was some kind of rape or assault. I didn't actually pay too much attention to it because I was moving but that happened a few few a couple of weeks ago here you know this these are just this this is just the beginning of a of a of a resurgence of of patriarchal oppression because there's no reason upon upon a kind of you know a sort of neutral world view there's no reason not to have a patriarchy because men are physically stronger and more domineering than women the only thing that can temper the patriarchy is the Acknowledgement that women are made in the image of God as men are, and and the the taming of the the masculine power by the power of the gospel, by the power of Christ, and 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 his his injunction to us to have to have love and and compassion for people. You know, through the teachings of Saint Paul, who tells husbands to love their wives and to give themselves up for them, as Christ gave himself up for the church. You know, there was no there was none of this kind of thing in the first century in in Rome. You know, there's, there's no no understanding of women to be like this at all, and there hasn't been outside of a, a outside of a Judeo Christian context. So that's just that's just the thing with women. I mean, that's that's where I would start with women. I mean, the thing about sexuality is is hard because you have to you have to sort of tease out what's 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 actually being said. Now, what I'm what I'm saying is that as a Christian, I just believe what every Christian has believed. Broadly speaking, for the last 2000 years, which is that God created sexual intercourse to take place in the context of a marriage between a man and a woman. And partly that's to do with the bonding of, of a man and a wife in husband and wife in a, in a marriage. And partly it's to do with procreation, to do with children as well. So it's inherently linked to childbirth. Um, and that's, that's the opinion. That's the view that, that Christianity has always had is the view that's rooted in the scriptures. It's rooted uh, not just in the New Testament, but in the, in the Jewish scriptures and in the Jewish tradition as well. That's all, that's all I'm saying. Now, does that mean that I hate people who have sex outside of marriage or I hate gay people or I hate people who have other sexual proclivities? Of course it doesn't. It's a complete lie. It's just a complete lie. I'm perfectly capable of showing friendship and love. And welcome in my church, in my home to people who have a different view. And I do it all the time, every day, because my view is a minority view, broadly speaking, in this culture. I have to do it all the time because people are, people are not living by that, by that Christian way all around me. And people in the church often aren't as well. So I, you know, I don't hate the, these people it, at all. It's very interesting what you're describing because, uh, Let's say if we go a hundred years back or 200 years back, you, the first time that I hear like 
oh, I feel you feel like a minority being a priest in this Orthodox religion. So, uh, so you feel like that that uh, you are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I live on a I live on a residential street here. Um, I would I don't I've got no idea, but I imagine that many many people on the street are living together and they're not married. And and I would imagine that the vast majority of people on the street would, if they're not in that situation, would think that that situation is totally normal and, and acceptable. So that that's that's the way the culture is, you know. And my view is, as I say, it's the Christian view. It's probably a minority view in this culture now, um, but that's that's the way it is. I don't hate people uh, who have a different view to me. It's just a lie. This is just a lie that that is put abroad by by people who want to to um besmirch the christian faith you know it's just you can you can disagree with something you can think that something's not ideal you can choose to live differently to somebody without hating them you know i don't hate i don't hate people uh, I, 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 i'm not saying that you hate people but let's say the the argument is not that uh, you hate people it's more like you treat people not in equal ways in for example uh, 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 for, I'm not sure if uh, there is, uh, girls are not allowed to be priests, right? In the, uh, uh, well, um, in the Church of England, women are ordained. I am part of the Church of England that doesn't uh, accept this and accepts the Catholic order of priests and bishops as, as being male, because that's what Christ revealed to the world, in my view. Uh, but you, you can, you can, um, you can I mean, just as a technical point, there are lots and lots of women who are ordained, uh, both bishop and priest in the Church of England. Um, but, you know, what I'd say about that is that um, my view is that women and men are absolutely equal in terms of being made in the image of God and uh, being deserving of the same level of, of love and respect and dignity. But that God made us differently and calls us to occupy different roles in the family and in the church. So my wife has a role in our family. Um, I have a role in our family. And those roles are, um, they overlap and they are related to each other, but they're never, nevertheless different. She has a maternal role. I have a paternal role. And there's, there's a difference between those two things. And the same is, the same is true, I would say, in the church as well. Um, God calls men to be priests, in my view, and bishops, because, um, because men are the only ones who are, ex who are capable of exercising that paternal role in the church, which is to be a father to the whole congregation. Now, of course, you have mothers in the church as well. Uh, but again, they, they exercise their role in a maternal way, which is distinct from, from a, from a, from a paternal way. Um, and so in this sense, I do believe in a kind of, um, a benign, uh, hierarchical structure. And when I say hierarchical structure, you know, that's apt to be misunderstood because I don't think it's men who are, who are above and women who are below. I believe that priests and bishops uh, are called to be servants of the congregation. Um, so we're not, you know, we're not on top. We're, we're, we're given a particular role set apart for a particular role in order to serve, in order to serve God's people in the way that God has given us to do. So, yeah, I mean, I guess people find it hard to, to hear that and they think that that's sort of, um, that's sort of fundamentally repressive, uh, but I mean, I guess it's up to everyone, you know, how they, how they, how they see that, but I don't see it in that way. I see it as being the truth and as being something which actually brings about good fruit in the church and in people's lives and in families. Um, so. Very, very interesting. Uh, oh, but, uh, to that other thing that you, you didn't touch a lot on, on the sexuality part, uh, like the, again, the uh, thing is not that you hate uh, them. The thing is that they are not allowed to get married and they don't yeah. have the same privileges that yeah. the other people have. So yeah. what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, Gay people can get married. They're, they're absolutely capable of getting married, but marriage is between a man and a woman. So it's not that gay people can't get married, it's that they don't want to get married. And that's, that's something, it might sound like a pedantic point, but it's not a pedantic point because I refuse to accept that marriage can be redefined so that it's between 
two men or two women or any other or any other anything else than a man or a woman. That's what marriage is. It's a it's a reality. It's given to us by by God. So a, so so what you think is uh, is so you are saying that uh, basically that they are they are made wrong. You are saying that they are refused to give up on the truth that they are men and a woman. Like, do, do you, igno- uh, do you acknowledge this biological thing? Do you refuse, refuse to accept that they, they, a man can feel a woman? Like, uh, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Sorry. Could you just clarify the question? Cause it sounded like you were sort of asking about transgenderism at the end. What, can you just clarify what the question is? No, uh, tra- I, I'm not sure as well uh, how to define this stuff as well. But uh, let's say, do do you believe that a, a girl can feel inside her like she's a lesbian and she like oh, other okay. girls, yeah. or a man can feel like a woman and like other man? Yeah, yeah. Or yeah, I don't, I don't deny the reality of people of the same sex being attracted to each other. That's an absolutely real thing. What I'm saying is that marriage. Marriage is an actual thing. It's an actually objective existing thing, which is a lifelong sacramental union between a man and a woman in the sight of God. Um, and that's, I mean, you know, that's a particular Christian way of, of understanding it. But broadly speaking, this is how all cultures have, have seen it. And it's certainly the way that the Judeo Christian culture has seen it for thousands and thousands of years, for 6,000 years. So the burden of proof isn't on me to explain why I, uh, I don't accept gay marriage. The, the burden of proof is on, on the proponents of gay marriage to, to explain to me why the definition of marriage can so easily be changed and why it's such an unacceptable thing to insist that it can't. That's, that's what I'm saying. And as I say, that might sound pedantic, but it's really not because words have meanings, uh, and those meanings are important. Um, there's a separate question there about, you know, gay relationships and what one thinks of those and everything like that. But what I'm saying is that it's not some kind of matter of inequality to not allow gay people to get married. And if you think it is, then, then, and this is not an arbitrary thing to say, if you think it is, then it's a matter of inequality to not let three people get married or or to not let a person get married to a, to a, to an animal or something like that. Marriage is a real thing and you can't just define it at will. So yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes, it makes sense. Uh, I, you, you clearly state your positions, uh, that make sense. So, uh, I, I have a question more now on the, I, I want to say not, not congratulations, but I want to acknowledge that the, one of the problems that I believe, uh, the church ha- has generally, it's, uh, that they are not adapting to the new world. Like, Let's say you are doing like podcasting is a, is a thing that now is, is a big deal. And like uh, to spread the word there with the new technological advances, uh, stuff and to be on them and understand, not refuse to say, Oh, this is uh, for, uh, so uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on why you chose the podcast and how do you feel about that is growing and people are listening it and like uh, other, yes. Yeah, some so, yeah, about yeah absolutely. This. So, so the reason that Tom and I started the podcast originally wasn't because it wasn't for any other reason than um, we were in the midst of the situation with COVID, all the churches shut down, we're being propagandized and, and gaslit by the government and something was very badly wrong. And we weren't hearing anything from the church. All we were hearing was acquiescence and, and a repetition of this uh, diabolical narrative. So we decided to start the podcast just because we felt like there was something that needed to be said and sort of see how it goes. So we just started it from nothing. You know, we just started it with just a laptop and no publicity, no money, really nothing at all. And we host, you know, got the hosting site and everything, but that doesn't cost very much money. Um, so, so that's the way we started it. And then, um, because I think we were saying things that the church wasn't saying and people were, were hungry to hear this message. They needed to hear something in the midst of that darkness and that, that bleakness and that confusion and fear people were feeling. 
um, then we we found an audience. So we were kind of, I mean, I think, you know, I look at it now and I think really it was a providence of God, but I think, you know, we're sort of fortunate to have been in the right place at the right time. Um, the technology issue, I mean, I completely agree with you. We need to utilize this technology for good, just like the Christian church has always utilized technology when it's been developed, like we, you know, the Reformation, the, the printing press, or whatever, it, whatever else in other example you might want to think of, the radio and the television, you know, C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity, wartime lectures, or whatever you were to say, you know, this is just another form of technology. It's a particular type of technology. It's a revolutionary technology, which has really changed our lives so much, even in the time since I've been alive, you know, last 20, 25 years. But nevertheless, we've got to use it uh, for, for good and just see it as another way of, of getting the message out there, of being engaged in conversation and in robust dialogue with with the currents of the age so yeah that's my view so uh what did you learn uh, about this uh, because this is an exciting topic like podcasting like do you do you like it this is a good like uh yeah uh, uh, what i've always i've listened to podcasts for you know ever since i've been an adult i think i mean i'm not even sure how long podcasts have been around i can't even remember but i think it's about you know, maybe 15, 20 years podcasts have been around. I don't really know. But I, um, as soon as I sort of learned about them, as soon as I got a smartphone, I just started listening, listening, listening. And I've learned, I mean, I've learned a lot through reading and stuff like that, obviously. I mean, I've, I've done a lot of that kind of thing, reading and writing, but, um, I've learned so much just through listening to podcasts, you know, history, uh, philosophy, theology. Uh, the news, you know, current events, you can learn, you can just learn and learn and learn and learn. And that's, that's, you know, I love learning. So for me, it's, you know, podcasts um, are a great way of doing that. It's entertaining as well. You know, at the moment, I spend quite a lot of my time sort of clearing up and washing up and cooking and stuff like that, clearing up the kids mess. So I, you know, I just listen to podcasts. I still do, you know, all the time, every single day, audio books as well. So yeah, I mean, that's, I don't know. I think it's just when I got a smartphone. I don't know. What, what's what's your view on that? Uh, about a uh, similar view like you is like uh, a fun way to access knowledge that it doesn't feel like work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. yes, my my I think the biggest part of my education is let's say podcasting and understanding all this is because now you have access to. Uh, uh, billionaires is giving you advice on how to start a business. So mm. <laughs> it doesn't make sense uh, for me to go to university because I can have actually the cleverest minds in the world teaching me stuff. So yeah. it's, it's de definitely revolutionizing how young people learn uh, yeah. about this stuff. Uh, but uh, do, do you probably make money with this stuff? Uh, how do how do you uh, use the money that you make from this uh, podcast and stuff? Yeah, well, we we started a, a Patreon account um, when we was when we sort of started reaching an audience. We started a Patreon account, and at the time, none of us really needed the money. We just needed the money to kind of cover our overheads and everything like that. Uh, but we got loads of patrons basically that lots and lots of people wanted to support us and so um eventually we made the decision that i'd actually um sort of go part-time with the podcast and, and get a part-time role in the church um and so that's that's basically what we're doing now i'm actually living off the money that we make from the podcast but we don't um we don't really ad we don't advertise we don't have adver um we don't sell advertising space we just have people who who support the show and we give them like extras and stuff like we make a little audio podcast which is just a fun audio podcast uh, which is just for our patrons and stuff like that and release the episodes early um so yeah but it's basically enabled me to to work on this and it's given me a little bit more time to do some other stuff some writing and stuff like that and i'm writing this new book as well um so yeah so that's what we're using the money for at the moment and that's the plan for you know at least the next few years and, and sort of see see how it goes but i think so the thing Basically, for you to spend more time on it, uh, it like to basically, uh, it allow the money allows you to spend more time on doing work that will reach more people and at scale, not like just one person in the church or ten people in the church, thousands of people online. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that's that's the hope. Um, I have a Substack blog as well. I mean, I think, you know, I, but this has literally just happened. I've only just started this job. So we, we're just at the very, very early stages of this. But 
you know, we believe in the podcast. It's already it's already reached an audience mainly on audio. We don't get very high figures on YouTube. So I'd love to see I'd love to see the engagement grow. That the there's definitely scope for it. You know, I'm sure you've done this kind of thing. Like if you look, if you break down the demographics, you know, where people are listening and how many, you know, in London, it will be like, even though thousands of people download the podcast in London, it would be like two, 300 people downloaded the episode or something. So you just think, you know, London's a city of eight and a half million people. There must be more people who listen to the podcast in London. So, and that's just the same everywhere. So there's definitely scope to expand it and to reach more people. So yeah, I'm hoping we're going to be able to do that. Um, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to expand this, this podcast and, and reach a wider audience. But as I say, we're just at the beginning of, of having that, that time. Is, that space. is the church uh, supporting this? Uh, is it helping you guys with this? Do they have objections about this? The church, um, Yeah. So basically, well, I suppose you could say the church is supporting this by giving me this job. So that's good. Um, so they've, they've supported me to that extent, but really the podcast is our thing. You know, we finance it ourselves. We, um, it's all us, you know, the vision is all ours and, uh, we don't, um, it's not edited by anyone or anything like that. So it's, it's, um, and it's important that it, that it should be that way because we're, we're ordinary priests. We're not representatives of the hierarchy of the Church of England. We're not bishops. We're not part of the establishment. And really, that's important because we see ourselves at least partly as a prophetic voice to the church to call the to call the church to faithfulness. And we couldn't do that if we were if we were more central and more part of the established aspect of the church. So you feel like uh, this is also a voice to keep uh, the church or. Uh, uh in line to help the, like to push back on what stuff they're doing so that you so you think this kind of this podcast can achieve that as well well i don't know how much it can achieve but i think that's definitely something we should be doing and we are doing i think there's a there's at least you know there's several functions to the podcast i think partly it's that um to 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 call the church to faithfulness to re- remind the church of her vocation Uh, to Christ and to the truth. Um, partly it's also to reach people, you know, to help people who are Christians, but also to reach people who are not Christians as well with the, with the message. So I think it's, it's a podcast that can, that has a kind of broad application to lots of, lots of different groups. Uh, I ask every guest in this podcast, if I give you one trillion dollars, how do you spend it to have maximum impact? Wow. I mean, that's a really difficult question because we follow a man who had no money and he didn't have, well, you know, if he had money, it was a very, very small amount. And he traveled around with his disciples and his followers, you know, preaching the message, uh, living in a very, very simple way. So in a way, the more money the church has, the worse it is for the church spiritually. So, um, you know, I think probably the best thing to do, yeah, I think probably the best thing to do would be to give the, give the trillion dollars away, uh, immediately. Um, because I think it would, be, uh, well, I mean, I guess I just, I honestly, I find that really difficult question to answer. I think that the, I think that the, um, The poor, people who are people who are genuinely in need, you know, I think that that would be what you'd do. You'd you'd have to use it to set up philanthropic organizations to help people, to help children, to help people who are hungry, to help people who need a place to live. I mean, but a trillion dollars is a lot, you know, you need to employ people. I don't know, you'd need to start some kind of philanthropic organization or something like that to help women um, who have pregnancy crisis, you know, That's that's the kind of thing I think you'd 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 want to start doing. Uh, definitely not. You definitely shouldn't invest it. I think that that's a bad thing to do with it. I think it has to be given away. You know, so so I think that's that's the kind of thing. But as I say, a trillion dollars. Wow. That shouldn't you shouldn't give me that money. I would I would not know what to do with it. <laughs> so so but is it so you spend it immediately because uh, you think money brings corruption as I understand. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, Jesus says, you know, um, lay up your treasures in heaven, 
where moth and rust don't um, don't um, cause rust and decay, where thieves don't bre- bre- break in and steal and so on. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I think what Christ means by that uh, is that um, the things that we hold on to, the things that we treasure, the things that we value, our hearts become attached to them. And that goes for that goes for wealth um, preeminently, you know. So, so the more we have, the 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 harder it is actually to 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 be detached from it psychologically and spiritually. You know, we hold on to it, we grasp onto it, and it becomes something which is so important to us. Um, and so, to be free from that, it's a, it's just easier to to have less, you know. And that's is a challenge to me because you know now I live in a nice house, I have plenty of money. Um, I'm, you know, very, very comfortable. So, it's, you know, I'm, I'm applying this to myself as much as, as much as to anyone else. But, but it does something to your heart. You know, it becomes something that possesses you rather than something you possess. And um, that's not good from a spiritual perspective. And it's not good when the church is is in that position either. When it's when the church is too wealthy. You know, when the church is too overfed. Uh, a lean, hungry church is is much better. So, yeah. So it would be. It would be a case of giving the money away to as many people as possible as quickly as you can and to the most, you know, to the most needy, I suppose that would be, that would be where, where I'd start. You know what, as you Phidias, can I say one more thing? Actually, the other thing I would do with it, just on a practical note, is I would employ loads and loads and loads of priests in the Church of England. That's priests are uh, just for some reason, the church just seems to have a real problem. Um, uh, making money available for priests for stipends and for, for clergy housing and this is part of the reason that the church of england is doing so badly at the moment um because so many churches just don't have priests so i would spend the money on that i have to say practically that would be something i'd spend the money on okay uh i'm curious to hear uh your thoughts on artificial intelligence because we cannot ignore this topic uh, <laughs> now now uh, uh, now it <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely so um I'd encourage um, viewers to 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 um, listen to a podcast I did with a man called Jobs Landgreeb um, and Barry Smith, which was I, th- I did it last year. It's called Why Machines. I think it's called Why Machines Will Never Rule the World, and that's um, we're that's going the- to put it down on the link in the description. Yeah, yeah, and that's um, it's uh, it's the name of Jobs' book as well. And uh, Jobs is a and and Barry uh, Barry's a, a philosopher and um, widely published academic and Jobs is I mean Jobs is just a, a genius he's he's an absolutely brilliant man in so many areas but um, essentially they they make the argument that uh, for artificial intelligence to reach a singularity which means the point at which a machine could kind of become conscious is 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 impossible it's it's literally impossible and it can't happen and they they believe that the um the sort of pronouncements of people like elon musk and and people like yuval noah harari and everything that these are just um these are these are fantasies and that they they can't they can't actually happen um and i i did find that pretty convincing but but i think the best thing to do if people are interested in that is to go and listen to podcasts because it's quite a technical argument um i think just on a basic sort of philosophical level um machines machines are always driven by algorithms even even machines that um that can learn so machines will never in themselves become conscious they'll never sort of develop intentions or anything like that so i'm not i i just think on a basic level i i can't okay, see but, but 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 let's say they don't develop consciousness like they are going to um probably remove a lot of jobs uh, and uh, we're going to have by one input more output and we're going to uh, get I don't know maybe to a point that not a lot of people need to work yeah uh, well, uh, yeah I mean there have always been people who, is, who have speculated that technology will mean that people have to work less I mean I think um, I forget what the exact quote but I think HD Wells uh, said you know that basically people won't be working by by the advent of the 21st century or something like that and people have always said that but but the fact is is that work uh, work always proliferates um, regardless of what happens with technology it just it just um, 
it just changes the nature of work rather than eliminates it altogether. I mean, look at emails, for example. I mean, ostensibly, emails should make your life a lot easier because you can communicate more quickly. But it actually means that you spend hours and hours um, every week, if not every day, answering messages that people send you because they can do it more. I've been doing it myself today. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't eliminate work. It simply prolifer proliferates work. I mean, it might be that AI will, um, will take away jobs that are perhaps more, um, menial, you know? So if you have a very simple machine that needs to be driven or something like that, a computer could do that. But nevertheless, there will still be somebody who needs to maintain the machine and somebody who needs to, you know, clean it and oil it or replace its parts or whatever it might be. Um, so it will be, it will be. So you are not, you are not afraid of this uh, change. So you are not saying that it's a threat to us. No, I don't think it's a threat to us at all. Um, and I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't be afraid even if it were, but, but the, I think what people, the reason I said the thing about uh, machines developing consciousness is I think that that is something that people are afraid of, you know, a kind of te Terminator or Matrix style reality where the machines become a sort of race of enemies that try and eliminate the human race. So just that's, that's not, that's not something which is, is possible because machines literally can't develop consciousness and intention. They, they never will have intention or consciousness. It's just not something that can be done. It can't be, it can't be mirrored in a machine. And that's the, um, uh, because, because of the complexity involved. And that's the, um, Uh, that's the argument that Jobs, Jobs makes. But I think more broadly, you know, in, within the providence of God, I just don't believe in that kind of apocalyptic scenario. I don't believe that humans are going to be wiped out by machines or superseded by machines. Um, God has a plan for this planet and he's got a plan for the human race. And I don't believe it involves being eliminated by an army of terminators or, or, um, you know, enslaved by, by, um, by robots and, and put in the matrix or something like that. I just don't believe that's going to happen. So for last question, I like to ask uh, what you want to leave behind in this world. And also for people to subscribe, I like <laughs> to ask that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Please look up our podcast as well. Uh, yes, we'll put, we'll put the link on the description guys for you to go and watch the all their podcasts and understand more about his beliefs and what the church beliefs are and what the disagreement with the church are so which is yeah, very absolutely. interesting topic yeah it's all on irreverendpod.com our website by the way irreverendpod.com that's where you can find it um where, where what i want to leave behind um you know if i could if i could do anything at all um i'd like to um leave behind family who are who are happy, who are um, living full human lives, people who know God, know Christ and know God's purposes in their lives, you know, for my children and uh, for their children as well and anyone else who is in my family. Um, that's what I'd like fundamentally. Um, and and beyond that, I'd like to be able to have have helped people to to know Christ as much as, as, much as possible. That's the thing that um, gives me the greatest joy when I feel like I've been able to share something of God's love and God's life with people. Um, and that's, that's what I'd like to be able to do as, as much as possible. You know, if I, if I, um, you know, if I have any more effect um, than that, well, I don't know whether that's even possible, you know, as a kind of thinker or writer or anything like that, you know, it would be nice to have an, it might be nice to have an effect in that sense as well. But ultimately I see it all as a way of, of, um, of sharing the truth with people and, and inviting people into a relationship with God, which they were created for. So that's what I think I'm, I'm here to do. And, and that's what I'd like to have done by the end. Thank you for watching guys. We love you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you.